Good morning, everybody. Russ Barkley here. Happy New Year to you. It's now 2025, and welcome back to my weekly research review. As always, I have some dad jokes to begin with, and these dad jokes are going to continue to be along the Christmas theme, mainly because my son gave me a big stack of these uh, jokes, and I thought I'd use a few more before putting them away until next year. So, so thanks for your patience. So here's your first dad joke. What did one snowman say to the other? Do you smell carrots? <laughs> That's a thinking person's joke, I think. What do you get when you cross a snowman with a vampire? Frostbite. <laughs> you probably heard that one before. I know I had. How much did Santa pay for his sleigh? Nothing. It was on the house. Get it? Okay, enough of these rather silly dad jokes. Let's move on to the weekly research roundup for this Saturday. And we're going to talk about five different articles this morning. So the first article up is a study that is going to examine the dietary patterns of teens with ADHD and look at the relationship to different aspects of their symptoms. So the study involved 810 teenagers and about 80 of them were said to have ADHD. And the teens completed a variety of questionnaires, including questionnaires about their dietary habits. The study found that the ADHD teens had much higher snacking behavior than the other teens did. When they looked more closely at other aspects of their dietary patterns, they found that there were no differences between the groups in healthy, animal-based, sweet, or beverage dietary patterns. So it was principally in the domain of snacking that the individuals differed. They did some further analyses and found that the extent of impulsivity was actually negatively related to sweet dietary intake. I found that a bit surprising. On the other hand, they found that the more impulsive individuals were, the greater the beverages they consumed. Uh, and all of these findings do fit with other research that shows that individuals with ADHD, both children and adults, consume more of what we call a Western dietary pattern, which is high carbohydrates, high processed foods, more sugar, particularly sugar-containing beverages, and so on. So uh, this is not a new finding, but it does, I think, elaborate a little bit more on the relationship here, particularly in teenagers. So there you have it. People with ADHD, in this case teens, are snacking more than other individuals. Okay, next up is a study that comes to us out of Japan, and this is a study on the link between maternal use of tobacco during pregnancy and risk of ADHD in their offspring. And these offspring have been followed up to ages six and eight years of age. The study uses a very large sample. There were more than 7,200 children that were included in this analysis, along with their mothers, of course. And the mothers also uh, were asked to give up blood samples in their third trimester of pregnancy. And these blood samples were used to corroborate the mother's smoking patterns during pregnancy. So what did they find? They found that mothers who consumed more tobacco had a elevated risk of ADHD in their children, about, oh, let's see, more than double the risk than we saw in the non-smoking group. So uh, again, one more study finding that maternal tobacco use is predictive of risk for ADHD in offspring. Now, having said that, let me point out that this study did not measure the genetic transmission of disorder from mother to child. Why is that important? Because we know that mothers with ADHD are likely to smoke more than other mothers when they're pregnant. And that it's not the smoking that's causing the difficulty. It's the mother's genetics that increase the risk in their offspring. And this study didn't control for any of that. But other studies have and they have concluded that 
the earlier link that was shown between tobacco use and pregnancy and risk for ADHD in children is mainly mediated by genetics. To put it another way, the mother smoking is simply an indicator that the mother probably has ADHD as well. And that's what's increasing the risk. So just thought you ought to know about this study, but also know of one of its flaws, which is that it's not genetically informed. So it may be reaching the wrong conclusions. Okay, our third study is on the relationship of online social activity time and ADHD in teenagers. This is a study known as the ABCD study that follows children through adolescence into early adulthood and is looking at both changes in brain structure and functioning using a variety of neuroimaging methods, but also cognitive development using various tests and rating scales of cognition. That's why it's called ABCD, the Adolescent Brain and Cognition Development Study. Now, this is a large study, and in this case, the Chinese investigators who are on this research team looked at the data for more than 11,800 individuals in the study. And as I've said, these individuals have been followed for a considerable period of time. And what they're looking at is the self-reported use of technology for online social activity. Now, they initially found that early online social activity use predicted an increase in later symptoms of ADHD. They then did the reverse analysis and found that earlier symptoms of ADHD were not predictive of an increase in online social media use. So that's a bit of a surprise, and it does suggest <clears throat> that there might be some exacerbation of ADHD by online social activity time. Now, they went further and looked at differences between the sexes of these teenagers, and they found that the relationships did not hold for the males. So online social activity use is not related to ADHD later symptoms in males, but it was in females, suggesting that females have a particularly increased risk for online social activity, possibly exacerbating their ADHD symptoms over time. But again, I want to caution, these are just relationships, even though they do involve some longitudinal follow-ups, as well as some statistical controls, suggesting that there might be a causal relationship here, uh, but obviously more research needs to be done. But I thought you might want to know about that particular study. Next up is a study looking at the shared genetic links between sleep and various neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric conditions. Now, the authors use very large databases and genome-wide scans of the individuals in the study. They had more than 225,000 people with ADHD in the study. They also had people with autism, with bipolar disorder, with major depressive disorder, and schizophrenia. Now, they're going to calculate the polygenic risk score for these individuals and separately for their disorders, and then look at their relationship to certain patterns of sleep disruption. And what did they find? Well, they found that ADHD was related to an increased risk for insomnia. No surprise there. But so were all the other disorders I've just mentioned. So it looks like psychiatric disorders and neurodevelopmental disorders at least the one study here, do have an increased association with insomnia. They did not find ADHD to be associated with what's called an evening chronotype, which is a preference for staying up later into the night. I think clinical work suggests that there may be such a relationship in ADHD, but these authors did not find that 
it was genetically mediated. Only in the other disorders of autism, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, and schizophrenia did they find that the increased genetic risk for those disorders also increased the risk for this evening chronotype. So what that tells me is that the evening chronotype that adults with ADHD talk about may not have so much to do with their genetics, but with other factors, probably lifestyle factors, uh, in those individuals. Okay, just thought you ought to know about that study. My last study is also a genetic study. This is also a large study that is looking at the relationship between psychiatric disorders and cardiovascular disease. And the authors studied 12 different psychiatric disorders, including ADHD, and they looked at four different cardiovascular outcomes or diseases. What did they find? They found that the genetics for depression increased the risk for myocardial infarction. They also found that the genetic risk for ADHD seem to increase the risk for heart failure. Now, before you get too excited about these relationships, I want to point out that the increase in risk of heart failure in ADHD was less than 3%. So very low increase in risk. And the risk for depression being associated with myocardial infarction was about 13% over the base rate. So what makes these results statistically significant is that very large samples were involved in these analyses, but that doesn't necessarily make their results clinically meaningful. So I would not get too upset about these results. They only have a bearing when we're looking at very large populations where we see this slight increase in risk, even if it is statistically significant. Okay, that's it for this Saturday. Thanks for joining me on this channel, and thanks for being a subscriber if you are. And if you're not, think about subscribing. And as always, if you know someone that could benefit from this information, please pass along the channel information to them. So there you have it. And once again, I'll conclude in 2025 as I did in 2024 with live well, be well, and take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye now.